from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. Coming up on Ag Day, Republicans push to pass tax reform. Plus, a journey to the top for this North Dakota farm family isn't without challenges, Betsy Gibbon reports. In agribusiness, is there a case for a corn price rally? We've got record supplies, but we're consuming it. We're building record demand. Fruit imports are still on the rise, and the White House gets in the Christmas spirit. Ag Day, presented by the Chevy Silverado. High strength steel for high strength dependability. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Washington continues to inch toward tax reform as leaders push for a vote yet this week. The president and Republican senators meeting Tuesday to discuss the bill and measure support with nearly all of the Senate Democrats set to oppose the tax cuts. There's very little wiggle room. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said the Republican tax bill is good for small business owners. The overall tax package blends a sharp reduction in top corporate and business tax rates with more modest relief for individuals. And every small business group I can think of is on board for this comprehensive tax reform that we hope to clear the Senate this week. So we're excited about this opportunity. It's been 30 years since uh, the tax code was dealt with in such a comprehensive way to try to reform that code and make America more competitive. And we don't want to leave small businesses behind. They are the backbone of our communities. And rather than a tax code that is discouraging for them <clears throat> and discourages on entrepreneurship, through the high marginal tax rates and an unreasonable compliance burden, we need to really empower our small businesses to grow and create those jobs in our very own communities. Among the holdouts are deficit hawks who worry that tax cuts for businesses and individuals would add to the nation's $20 trillion debt. The top Democratic leaders in Congress declining a planned meeting with the president Tuesday about the budget. After comments he made on Twitter, Congress facing a December 8th deadline to pass stopgap legislation to keep the government open. Across the Atlantic, the European Union approving a five-year extension of the weed killer glyphosate. That decision not sitting well with environmentalists or farmers. The EU backing the extension with a qualified majority able to beat a mid-December deadline, which is when the current license expires. Farmers had wanted a 15-year extension, and during the heated debate, a non-governmental organization claimed two-thirds of Europeans support a ban on glyphosate. Journey to the Top is brought to you exclusively by SmartStacks. SmartStacks, stay true to your roots. As the remaining bushels of 2017 get shut in the bin, a North Dakota farm family is turning toward more pressing issues. Betsy Gibbon takes us to Colfax, North Dakota to visit 2014 Top Producer of the Year finalist Jay and Kara Myers as they battle an unexpected hurdle this harvest season. Working side by side, Jay and Kara Myers harvest the last of the 2017 crop. For being the last field planted, I, I think it's a pretty good looking field. Words of relief as grain prices on the board are sluggish. These days you gotta look at cost per bushel, not cost per acre. And basis in North Dakota isn't much better. It's been terrible this year on corn and soybeans. Uh, you know, right now we're looking at probably an 80 under basis for corn and harvest here. Couple that with a shorter planting and harvest window and you have farming in North Dakota. That's why the Myers look at what they can do every year to improve in the field. They've invested in variable rate technology, adjusting how much fertilizer or phosphate should be applied. Certain parts of the field actually called for no phosphate, and then there's other areas that called for 100 pounds of phosphate, so just a huge difference. I can basically control the dryer from, from right here. The Myers also installed technology, helping them to manage the grain dryers from the seat of the combine. It really helps to be able to keep our moisture just right coming out of the dryer. You know, you're letting the computer run it instead of having somebody sitting right there. The Myers like having control, which was a big part of Kara's life before returning to the farm full time. I left a corporate job about nine years ago to help my husband on the farm. Working together through the windiest days of harvest. But like the weather, not everything can be planned. The most important thing to me right now is is getting our crops off the field and, and getting the crops in the bin. And I'll get through my situation no matter what. Her situation? She was diagnosed with breast cancer one week before harvest. 
She only took a short break for her surgery before returning to the fields against her doctor's wishes. My feeling is we'll get through this. I have time to get this through, you know, get through this throughout the whole winter. But harvest is really just a, a four to six week time period. Soon her radiation treatments will begin and the farm will have to rely on help elsewhere. We've had a lot of neighbors and community support that have uh, delivered some meals and stuff. Finish building that other truck, that'd be enough for coal to come and get another one. Sure. I just like to, to try different things and I can do anything. A positive attitude moving forward. A husband and wife team racing against both harvest and life's hurdles together. Jay and Kara also found another way to diversify. They own Agro Valley Solutions, where the two sell liquid fertilizer products and equipment to customers. They also have a trucking company as part of that business. All right, thanks, Betsy. Now, Jay is a member of the United Soybean Board. He's helping to lay the groundwork for a new soybean crush plant east of Jamestown, North Dakota. He hopes it will help narrow the basis in that part of the country. Farmers in Texas, moving right along with cotton harvest. Mike Hoffman has an update. He joins us with today's crop comments. Good morning to you, Clinton. Some farmers in the south are wrapping up cotton harvest. This picture comes from Casey McAnally over in Spearman, Texas. USDA says farmers are working hard at finishing cotton harvest, too. 71% of the cotton crop has been harvested. That surpasses the five-year average by two points. Josh Schick near Gridley, Illinois, is doing some field work as well. He says it's perfect weather to work outside right now. USDA reports five days were suitable for field work in the state ending November 26th. And taking a look at the uh, root zone moisture, you can see uh, the wetness has really increased in the uh, northern Rockies and the northwestern parts of the country. We'll look at the rest of the country on this coming up. But first, here are some hometown temps. Farm Journal on Air is the go-to app for American agriculture. Ag Day, AgriTalk, U.S. Farm Report, and more. 24-7 access to all of your favorite shows, TV and radio. In your hands, on demand. Farm Journal on Air. Download the app today. When we come back, we'll tell you why Bill Biederman remains positive about grain prices despite record production. And later, Christmas makes its way to the White House. Unlock the power of ag technology this December in Indianapolis at the first ever Ag Tech Expo. Learn all about it at farmjournalagtech.com. Receive a free trial of the Daily Grain Plan newsletter from Roach Ag Marketing. Text ROACH to 31313. Start your subscription today by texting ROACH to 31313. Agribusiness, plenty of red on the board for commodities during Tuesday's session. Let's see how things close. More friends on the floor. Overall, the markets acted really well. You know, we never really saw any harvest pressure. The market generally had trended higher since mid-August. So despite the fact that we had a big crop on record acreage, uh, the market never really saw a whole lot of harvest pressure. One of the big concerns here moving forward is exports. You know, USDA projects that exports will account for 52% of total soybean demand. So this is a big, big deal. And it's of particular concern right now because export sales are lagging uh, what USDA projects them to be for the marketing year. The live cattle market was lower here on Tuesday after a higher trade on Monday. So kind of an indecisive back and forth type deal here this week. Uh, the market did finish with some strength last week. Funds, uh, large money managers continue to hold a pretty significant long position in this live cattle market, although they did reduce that position uh, in the previous week. But all in all, the funds still really like the cattle market. Uh, it seems as, as if even on the breaks, they continue to maintain a pretty uh, significant long position. And that's been kind of a constant here for several months now. Again, Joe Vec, Vec from CME Group here in Chicago. After weeks of sideways trades, is there any reason to be bullish about the corn market? One analyst thinks so. Tyne Morgan has more from our agribusiness desk. Here now with Bill Biederman of Allendale. Bill, when we look at 2017, you know, it's not a rosy picture for everyone. And I was recently at an ag bankers conference where some of these, these economists that were talking, they said, you know, maybe we survive, we have to survive another couple years of these low commodity prices, maybe a little bit longer. What are your thoughts? Well, it's definitely set up like it was in the 81 through 85 period as far as record supplies. There's a big difference though because ag policy back in the 80s was uh, the government was paying us to store grain. So we had huge warehouses full with an incentive to keep it there. 
But today we have more of a free market system. So let's hope that you know, NAFTA negotiations go well and other negotiations with uh, the Pacific area go well. And then the market is going to want our inventory. And you know, we've got record supplies of corn, wheat, mm -hmm. and rice, all the starch grains, soybeans, huge record, right? We also have record demand. So let me put it in perspective. In the corn market, the, U, the world corn stocks, nobody even thinks about this because we're all so bearish, just fell 10% from a year ago to now. We lost 20 million tons. That's a, almost 800 million bushel, okay? If we have just a 2% loss in production around the world, that would be a billion bushel loss like that. That's half of our carryover. It would change the dynamics of the corn market very well. So my point is this. We've got record supplies, but we're consuming it. We're building record demand. The exciting thing is we're at a price level where we're building that demand. If you change the supply any time over the next couple of years, it would be very, very rewarding to be long the market. And does it have to be supplied just in the U.S. or just in South America? Or are you talking, you know, I'm somewhere talking else? generics. I mean, I'm talking, I look at all the starch grains together because you can use starch grains in so many ways. Right. And, and it, you know, <laughs> we've just got this huge demand base. As long as we're having record production every year, we're going sideways and it could bury a lot of producers just out of cash flow problems. But you just throw one little glitch in the world and you just reduce supply a little bit. It's, I mean, we're already consuming more corn than we're producing in the world. That's hard to say when everybody is so bearish, but that is the truth and it's exciting. So I, I think there's a lot of reason to maintain ownership through, you know, have a plan. Hey, for the next two years, we're going to maintain ownership, whether it's options or cash or whatever. And if something happens, the family's going to be well rewarded. The downside risk is pretty minimal. All right. Thank you so much, Bill. We appreciate it. Stay with us. We'll be back with more Ag Day in just a moment. To talk with Bill Biederman one-on-one, -on -one, call Allendale Incorporated at 815-404-1917 or head online to allendale-inc.com. Ag Day, brought to you by the Enlist Weed Control System. More weed control, less drift and volatility, maximum yield potential. Welcome back to Ag Day, your meteorologist Mike Hoffman looking at the root zone moisture map. And Mike, I think what stands out to me is how dry it's getting in Arizona and, and yeah. that part of the country. They've had very little moisture lately and it's gotten wet farther uh, north. Farther east of the Rockies, you can just kind of see there's pockets of uh, dry and wet. But nothing major really stands out. I will say this though, the, uh, the, the severe drought areas, southern Missouri into Arkansas, northeast Texas, it's not good when your topsoil is dry as well because that doesn't uh, help that long-term drought situation. So we'll be watching that part of the country as well. Here's the weather map. You can see a weak system moving through the areas that I just talked about. So that might give you a little bit of topsoil moisture here, but this isn't a major system. This uh, will just kind of move slowly eastward into the central Mississippi Valley over the next uh, 24 hours. Cool, dry air coming into the uh, Great Lakes in the northeast. This is mostly Pacific air though. Same thing behind the next front. So there's no Arctic air coming for the lower 48 anytime over the next uh, week or so. After that, it could be Katie bar the door with the cold air, but we'll talk more about that coming up. High pressure in the southeast, keeping things dry as well. Next cold front sweeping across the uh, central and northern plains, not really producing any moisture at all. By the time it gets into the Great Lakes, there'll be a few spotty showers with it. A little bit of snowflake activity farther north. And the next uh, system coming in slowly to the Pacific Northwest with some rain and mountain snows out that way. By later in the day tomorrow, we'll see some showers through the uh, eastern Tennessee Valley into parts of the southeast with a little bit of rain and snow farther northward into the eastern Great Lakes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Taking a look at precipitation estimate over the past 24 hours, there's that little pocket in the uh, central plains that will spread eastward, but you'll notice it does kind of dry up a little bit as well, so it doesn't help too much in uh, those areas. There's nothing heavy anywhere in the lower 48 except for perhaps western Washington. You folks end up with a fair amount of moisture with a couple of different systems there. Snowfall is mainly in the uh, northern Rockies and uh, a little bit in the uh, east central Rockies, but not too much. Adding in the next 36 hours, the majority of it is north of the Canadian border because that's where the Arctic air is still located 
Farther south, it is pretty mild. Even these 30s and 40s are above normal high temperatures for the Northern Plains and the Great Lakes. 70s by the time you get to the Gulf Coast. Low temperatures tonight going to drop off mainly in the Rockies. You can see upper 20s, lower 30s. Otherwise, it's above freezing most areas except for the far northeast. And then highs tomorrow afternoon again, 70s in the southeast and 30s and 40s through the northern tier of states. That's all because the jet stream is mainly zonal west to east with little ripples coming in. But it continues to show a major cool down, cold blast coming our way by the middle and second half of next week for the Midwest. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. We head to Salem, Oregon. First of all, maybe some morning fog around, then a mix of sun and clouds, high 51. Topeka, Kansas, mild times of clouds and sunshine, high 53. In Salisbury, Maryland, lots of sunshine and nice. High temperature around 64 degrees. Well, up next, how much of the fresh fruit you eat is grown in this country? We'll have some new stats on imports, and the White House welcomes visitors to celebrate Christmas with tradition. Ag Day, brought to you by New Delaro Fungicide for Corn and Soybeans. Achieve personal best yields. News from our reporting partners at the Packer. Imports continue to represent a rising percentage of fresh fruit consumed in the U.S. If you exclude bananas, imports made up more than 38% of all fresh fruit consumed in this country last year. Now that's up 1% from 2015, but it's up 15% from 2010. USDA says this country imports 85% of all the avocados we eat and 12% of fresh oranges. A tiny wasp that's invading Spain could end up spoiling Christmas meals and snacks for many people because of its impact on chestnuts. The chestnut wasp has come in from China and is stunting the growth of commercial forests. Harvesting chestnuts is the economic mainstay of the Genal Valley and it's usually a busy time to lead up to Christmas. Local growers say the problem started about three years ago. The tiny wasp stunts the buds on the trees and the leaves don't develop. Affected trees are losing 70% of their annual production. Now the wasp has a natural predator in China, but the government is worried about introducing that predator there in Spain. Meanwhile, another mainstay of Christmas, the tree itself is under attack from fake trees made in China. The National Christmas Tree Association saying the number of artificial trees sold has doubled since 2010. That competition may be putting some U.S. growers out of business. Now, according to the Oregon Department of Agriculture, the number of growers has dropped by 30% since 2010. With a shrinking supply of real trees, prices have pushed higher. NCTA says prices for real trees are 200% higher than in 2014. Up next, the Christmas spirit arrives at the White House in the country of the next. Shop Machine Repeat Cyber Sale from November 27th to December 4th. Find special reduced price deals on all types of equipment from dealerships across the country. Make a purchase and receive $200 extra holiday cash. Visit www.machinerepeat.com slash sale. In the Country, brought to you by Kubota. Check out Kubota's RTVX 1140, a rugged utility vehicle with seating for four. Stop by your local dealer today or visit Kubota.com. The White House is open for Christmas once again. First Lady Melania Trump is revealing the Christmas spirit and receiving guests. And an 18 foot tall blue spruce grown by a tree farmer in Wisconsin is the focal point of the holiday decorations. The theme this year is Time Honored Traditions, which the White House says pays respect to 200 years of holiday traditions at the Executive Mansion. Children from Joint Base Andrews were first among the visitors to see the newly unveiled Christmas decorations. More than 150 volunteers from 29 states spent 1,600 hours during the long holiday weekend decking the White House halls. Glistening wintry branches line an east wing hallway that leads guests to a tree decorated with the Trump family's Christmas ornament. The official White House Christmas tree is located in the Blue Room. It's decorated with seals of every state and U.S. territory. More than 25,000 visitors are expected to tour the White House for the holidays. And the kitchen is ready. They baked and cooked 31,000 cookies for guests. 
That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. Start your day with us. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day. Ag Day, brought to you by Ram Commercial, America's longest-lasting heavy-duty pickups.